Thanks for joining me today. Uh, can you tell me who, what is your name and uh, what do you do? Absolutely. My name is Brian Kester and I'm the CEO of C-Control. Well, today we're going to be speaking about IoT platforms. Um, I think it'd be great if you can give us an overall kind of overview of what, what is an IoT platform and, and what, is, you know, what is its purpose. Yeah, an IoT platform is generally a cloud platform. That, uh, which means that it's something you typically would subscribe to over the internet or you okay. would install in your own data center. Okay. And it will basically handle data collection from remote machines and devices. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it will send uh, messages or data down to devices. It just varies by vendor. Um, and then at a base level, it also has typically what's known as a rules engine or some way of doing event processing on the data that's coming into the system. Okay. So simplistically, things like if you're monitoring a temperature sensor, is it too hot or too cold? If it's too hot, let's send somebody an alert. Okay. Um, so that's the basic definition of an IoT platform. Um, depending on, on what you're trying to accomplish, it may also include things like analytics. It may include a, a higher level programming, either language in the system or mm -hmm. some way of developing advanced logic. Okay. Um, it may help with business workflows, um, and it also may uh, just provide a whole visualization layer for you or tools to create visuals like charts and graphs, reporting, table reports, things that you would expect to find mm -hmm. in a software application. And this extends all the way, I mean, you were saying it, it's cloud-based and then extracts information from devices or computers or, or other things. Um, where do gateways fit into this whole uh, equation? Yeah, so the idea of a gateway, there's, there's a bunch of different actually definitions about this out in the world. Terminology is a real problem. Um, but Traditionally, a gateway is a physical box that mm -hmm. goes out in the field somewhere, and it's essentially the way to connect remote machines and sensors to the internet. And so it's a backhaul translator. So mm -hmm. it, it takes um, some connection, whether it's physical or another wired connection from the gateway down mm -hmm. to other sensors, okay. um, and aggregates that data and <clears throat> becomes a channel through which um, all the data flows. So it's an aggregation point. Now, some folks deploy software down to those gateways, that run analysis and routines and look for problems out of what we, we call the edge. Hmm. Um, so, so classically, that category is a gateway, and there's different levels. You can have gateways talking to other gateways, and, it's, and then people start to use terminology like concentrators and things of that nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's also the notion of a software gateway. So like, for example, in, in our platform, we have a gateway network around our cloud, hmm. and those gateways are essentially traffic cops for the types of machine traffic that comes off of different types of machines. So one gateway is dedicated to, for example, talking to devices that communicate over this protocol called MQTT, whereas another gateway is dedicated to, to talking to devices that are operating on UDP. Interesting. Um, so it's actually a central, a central concept of what we do is a software-defined gateway at the cloud level. So there's cloud-level gateways, and then there's physical gateways that are out, out in the field. So your, a cloud-level gateway then would have a one, I mean, the networking the networking topology is really a device to cloud, and every and every device goes directly to the cloud. Is that right? It can be device to cloud. It can be device to device. It can be whatever. I mean, from from a cloud provider and IoT mm -hmm. platform's perspective, it's just all internet traffic. Mm -hmm. And at least at our level, we just basically have people send data to an IP address, and we send data back out through an IP address down to some other IP address. Okay. What's behind the IP address that we're communicating with? Mm -hmm doesn't matter to us. If it's the endpoint, fine. If it's the midpoint, that's fine as well. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So so that's that's interesting that you can have a software-defined gateway in the cloud, is what Absolutely. you're saying. And you're just making connectivity. You're just you're just a patch a patch board uh, connecting things together. Yeah. And that's, that's a function of, of, of the declining cost of putting internet stacks into everything. Mm. So mm. if you can't put an internet stack into your endpoint, then you bring it back up to the gateway level. Right. Right. But yeah, at some point, um, as, as device costs, costs decrease, uh, I just saw a $3 Wi-Fi chip from Shenzhen. It's not production yet, but it will be soon. Um, there will be a Wi-Fi connection and everything. So the idea of gateways, depending on your application, may uh, be either go away or mm -hmm. may be terribly useful. Yeah, yeah. And now you're saying that the, the network, I mean, if it's communicating with the cloud, isn't going to require a network stack anyway? The device? Um, yeah, where, whatever that logic, whatever that last point is that okay. is a network stack All right. is, is what we think of. But but at, at that point, it, when, you, when you have in, in devices with enough computing uh, capacity, there are basically many computers and their gateways in and of themselves. And if they could network with each other, then they're sort of a distributed gateway network. Right, right. So there's a lot of different permutations of it, just like there's a lot of different ways to network a building yeah, or yeah. To network a city.
Well, let's, let's, uh, let's rise up in elevation a little bit. So a company is looking to implement the Internet of Things. A central component is the IoT uh, gateway. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there's different approaches. There's, you, can, you can buy it, I suppose. You can, you can buy the, the platform. You can, you can lease the platform or rent the platform, and you can, and, or you can just um, uh, buy, rent, or... or um, or build. Or build. Yeah, yeah build it yourself. So, so what, do you, what do you normally recommend uh, to, to, I guess, the customers or the clients or the potential clients that you uh, talk to about? Well, we think that, of course, people should rent things before they buy them or at least try before you buy. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, depending on what you're trying to do, um, it may be sense for you, for example, a lot of device companies will give you um, a data collector and a gateway with the device itself and kind of a software-based management layer there. Mm-hmm. So if it comes with a device that you've selected, um, that you might want to just go ahead and, and use that. Right. And then you're basically bypassing the need for some sort of central place to mm-hmm. pass all the data through um, and worried about what systems are going to consume the data. Um, however, if you're going to use more than one device or you don't want to be locked into a vendor, you really ought to take a look at a whole class of IoT platforms out there, of which we're one, um, that can do multi-device, um, multi-vendor uh, device management, mm-hmm. um, irregardless of the kind of protocols or technologies that are out at the edge. because. Um, unless you have uh, things that you're putting out in the world that you expect to be out there for 10, 15, 20 years, odds are you're either going to have a hardware refresh, mm. um, maybe even a provider go out of business, and you don't want to be locked into that world. So traditionally, people, a, a lot of times, if they didn't want to be locked in that world, would build something on their own. They would mm-hmm. actually use um, you know, easy-to-use tool sets like Microsoft's tool set or even some other um, really accessible technologies out there like lightweight Python development, et cetera, and create their own. But... They're running into two problems. Um, generally, it either won't scale or just the development effort ex- itself is expensive. Right. Um, there are enough IoT platforms out there that you can either rent one uh, through the crowd and subscription model like C-Control, or you can buy one and bring it in-house and install it on your own servers. Mm-hmm. So it, makes, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to actually do that anymore. Because the messaging uh, and the data coming from the devices is uh, when, when, when you grow your IoT project is a, is a non-trivial problem. You can overwhelm a, a system pretty fast with the amount of data. Well, I mean that that's you know that that's one potential issue. Are there any other potential issues that you know buyers or or renters should be considering when when looking at platforms? Well, platforms in general. Mm-hmm. Um, if you move up above the gateway level, um, you have to really consider how much time is it going to take me to develop in this platform. Um, is one big consideration. Um, a lot of IoT platforms provide nice tool sets for you if you want to learn um, JavaScripting or Groovy scripting or some other sort of scripting to do mm. um, logic, analytics. Um, now, analytics is a is a kind of a broad term. It covers everything from statistical analysis to um, long term analysis, like how a machine's functioning, all the way out to like forecasting. So you want to look for what's the maturity and competency level of that tool set, and then also how easy is it to use. Um, that's just the analytical level. And then, of course, you need a way of actually visualizing data um, and being able to see it. So there's plenty of outside tools out there, ranging from Tableau um, and Domo, which mm-hmm. are dashboard building tools, mm-hmm. to native tool sets like C-Control, where we already have the data. We can analyze it and you can generate, without being a coder, um, your own visualizations, you know, tables, maps, charts, graphics, diagrams, pictures of things themselves and assets. Um, all those capabilities, you know, vary in, in their sophistication level um, and, and ease of use level across different platforms. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's end it with uh, some advice. So, what, what advice would you give businesses when they're first approaching this problem of of you know deciding what to do with an IoT platform? Um, what should they be looking out for? I think the big thing you need to be concerned with is that if your project is ambitious, or particularly if it's something that's revenue driven, will impact your customers is that you obviously want to make sure that your product will scale. So you can attack scale in two ways. You can develop a prototype and put it out in the market, get some traction, which is this is kind of a Silicon Valley approach, get some traction to the point which it breaks, and then redesign the whole solution from scratch and go back out to market with something new. There's pros and cons to that approach you know, that are followed by Silicon Valley startups all the time. Um, but more often, what we've discovered in IoT, and, we've, and our whole team's been doing this for well over a decade, is that um, every project, no matter how well planned, um, may not actually be on target in terms of what you thought the project was going to deliver. Mm. So you may think the customers want to buy the product for reason A, but it turns out they want to buy your IoT service for, for reason B. Um, 
you may have to change the feature sets to get included to match what customers are willing to pay for or, or operational users in your enterprise. Um, generally, in over 90% of the cases we've seen, you're going to have to change your solution at least two to three times within a really? month period. Really? Um, and of course, every time there's a, there's a change or iteration cycle in traditional software development, that's going to be very, very expensive. So you really have to think through how well thought out your service is. If it's very well thought out, and you've covered all your bases, I would say go ahead and build something because mm -hmm. it'll be yours, it'll be your intellectual property, um, you can maintain it over time, et cetera. Um, however, if you don't know necessarily what you're doing, I would advocate in almost every situation to go ahead and try before you buy yeah. and rent first. And our platform has been designed that way for people to run uh, market tests, experiments, operational processes, tweak things, um, and the data is easy to, to get out of the system through open APIs. And that's another thing I would say is make sure if you're going to work with an IoT platform provider mm. um, that they're open about your ownership of the data. It's easy to get to either manually mm -hmm. and export easily mm -hmm. or from some other system interrogating it and pulling all the data out. Um, but the, the, the reasons to build, buy, or rent are as varied as the use cases that are out there in IoT and, and how strategic what you're developing is to your company. Um, we've had customers who will use this purely as prototyping and find that, that the service they want to put in front of their customers is, is quite frankly too strategic to, to trust any third-party company, mm. and they'll just develop it in-house once they have the service finalized. Mm. Um, but then other folks will view themselves more as a data science company, and they just want the data, and, and our platform is just a means to an end. Um, and in fact, from our, our perspective, the whole idea of application development in the Internet of Things is, is, will be a commodity. It's, it's the data that's more important right. and the, the data scientists that you apply to that, that data. No, great advice. Well, thank you, Brian. Absolutely. Thank you, Bruce, for having me.